was distressed, so he pulled the car over to see how the rabbit was doing. Was the rabbit going to be okay? Unfortunately, the rabbit had passed. The rabbit was dead. He started to cry. A woman who was driving saw the man off the side of the road, and she pulled over to see what was going on, what was happening. He said, the rabbit ran in front of me, and, and I accidentally ran him over him, and now he's dead. And the woman looked at him and said, well, I know what to do. So she runs over to her car, opens up the trunk of her car, and she pulls out a spray can and goes over to the rabbit and sprays the contents of the can on the rabbit. The rabbit jumps up, looks at them, he waves, and he runs, hops down the road, 50 feet down the road, he turns around, and he waves again. And then he hops down down the road, and he waves again. The man is going, what is going on? What was in that can? She turns around the um, can, and it says, hairspray. Bring, <laughs> brings dead hair back to life. <laughs> Adds permanent wave. Well, you know, you can only do some things on Easter, right? <laughs> right? Okay. If you don't remember anything else, you'll remember the rabbit. <laughs> so, you know, Easter is actually a very curious time because it's a blend of paganism, Christianity, and Judaism. In fact, the word Easter is derived from estre, also known as Astora, an ancient Anglo-Saxon goddess who symbolized rebirth of the dawn and rebirth of life in the spring. The arrival of spring was celebrated all over the world long before there was religious meaning associated with Easter. As Christianity grew and expanded, they started to figure out that they could put Christianity in with those which were the pagan celebrations and make it easier to assimilate. Because Estore was the goddess of spring and her symbolism dealt with renewal and rebirth, the Christian belief in the resurrection of Christ fit in very well. Now, Easter, to traditional Christians, has been the commemoration of the trial, the execution of Jesus, and then the rising up um, of his body on Easter. Easter is usually known as one-third passion play and two-thirds of miracle story. It's the story of the raw physical suffering, mentally and physically, emotionally, of a good man whose only crime was to carry out a divine assignment to bring light and love into a world that was racked with violence, hatred. This simple Jewish man on a mission to bring light and teach it was only where the darkness was. He threatened the status quo, and so he was eliminated. Easter is actually an allegory, a metaphorical um, representation of the passing away of the old and the renewing. You know, everything in the world is always renewing itself. The death of Jesus is a symbol of l releasing the old life, like the caterpillar turning into a butterfly, which I spoke of last week. It is about living in the conscious presence of the divine, to recognize that the divine is within us, and to know that there's a butterfly self, as each and every one of us, that is seeking to release its caterpillar limited life and ways of seeing itself in rising up into the glorious butterfly of love and light that it really is and that we really are. Easter is not a mysterious, magical show, show where a man is transformed, but it's a template, a blueprint of transformation that we can go through. So, what is the resurrection? The resurrection is what Easter's all about. Well, here's a true story. 
priest at the church called his kid, the kids up and says, does anyone know what the resurrection is? And one little boy spoke up quickly and he goes, I don't know for sure, but if you have one for four hours, you have to go to the hospital. I expect some groans and some laughs. Okay, again, it's an Easter joke. You can't tell it any other time of the year. Uh, what can I say? It is, uh, it's time to play. So then we have the little boy's definition of what resurrection is. Well, Charles Fillmore, what's his definition? Charles Fillmore is one of the co-founders, along with Myrtle Fillmore, of Unity. He says, and he has a book that he wrote called The True Lent. He writes, Easter is the celebration of the re resurrection of Jesus. Its inner meaning and spiritual significance is the awakening and the rising up to spiritual consciousness of the I am. The I am that I am that's in every one of us, which has been dead in its awareness of the truth and buried in the tomb of illusions. He says, every time we rise to the realization of the eternal indwelling life, making union with the God self that lives within us, that's beating in our hearts, the resurrection takes place. See, the whole Bible is actually about the evolution of consciousness, and I spoke a lot about that last week, is that we want to evolve from the atom consciousness, which is only aware of itself, to the we are one. We are one body, one being, but in all these individualized packages of the divine. When I look at you, I don't see a person. I see an expression of divine love looking at me, and I'm divine love looking back at you. We're mirrors of each other but we have forgotten, we have been conditioned in our minds by our cultures, by those who don't know. So we seek to unbecome all those things that we were told. We are not sinners. We, sin means that we have missed the mark, missed the truth of who we are. I am the divine and so is everyone else. And sometimes the divine has some interesting behaviors, wouldn't you say? But see, we're either coming from love or there's a call for love. When you ever are in a lower vibration of who you are, it's because there's part of you that needs to be loved and not condemned and judged, which is what we tend to do. So we want to have this resurrection. However, in order to do this, something has to happen first. What might that be? Well, it happened on Good Friday. It's the crucifixion. The crucifixion, according to Charles Fillmore, it's the crossing out in consciousness, the error thinking, okay? The, the way that we've been conditioned to see ourselves and see one another. We cross it out and we release the fear limiting based ways of thinking. It's like a caterpillar, right? That's just feeling very limited. But we wake up and we become, we rise up and to realize, and we have to go into the tomb. Isn't it interesting that the womb and the tomb and the cocoon all rhyme? So you have to go into that space. You have to cross off all those things that have interfered with the truth of your being. And once you go within, then the experience of transformation can happen. But we have to do our work which is to crucify, identify those thoughts that have been limiting us. So here's the thing. We, it requires anything that's new in life, anything that's seeking to evolve, means something else has to die. It is the truth. And how many times do we hang on to things, right? We hang on to people, places, situations, beliefs, why? Part of it is because we're afraid of not having that. It's familiar. We hang on to things that don't serve our highest good. And I know that every single one of us hangs on 
to something, is hanging on to something, whether we want to own it or not. In fact, I invite you to close your eyes and take a deep breath and without judgment, what is it that I'm hanging on to that blocks my greater good? Just see what comes up. Just notice what you notice. What am I hanging on to? And now the next question is, why am I hanging on to this? What am I afraid of if I let this go? Good. Again, just to have the awareness of what we have that wants to be released. And to understand that most of the time we hang on to stuff because we're afraid. And there's a lot of things to be afraid of. Not knowing what's next. Not knowing how we're going to do it. Not being alone. Just the fears, they keep us stuck and locked in. And that's what Jesus had to face on his day on the cross. He faced those fears. Everything is a medical, med- medical, med- medical, metaphysical interpretation that he had to face the fears in his own mind. Everything in the Bible is a symbol of something. We, we look at things literally, but there's something different. And that's what metaphysical means. Meta means beyond the physical. What does it symbolize? What does it mean metaphorically? And how does it relate to me? I mean, you come here and it's like, well, I'm going to hear a story and does it affect me? Well, my purpose and my intention every Sunday is to give you something that's going to make you think, make you wonder, make a shift and make a difference for you and our world. Because each one of us, as we shift our own worlds, transforming the world, as we say in our mission, one person at a time begins with me. If I want world peace, I need to have world peace where? Right here, when I don't have conflict in different parts of me. Are you with me? Yeah, okay, good. So I'm going to go into the crucifixion uh, story because here's the thing. That whole crucifixion is, again, a blueprint. You want to know how to cross off that which has been blocking you? There are seven statements that Jesus made, are recorded in the Bible, that he said. And you're free to take notes, (laughs) or you can listen to this again. So there are seven phrases that we can apply to our lives. And you know what? guess what? There's seven days to the week. I like to put here, one day I'm going to focus on this. And then the resurrection experience, the crucifixion, it's not a one-time event. This is something that we work on every day. So we're going to begin on Monday. So Mondays, would your assignment would be, and I'd like to take the phrase and turn it into one word. The word is, forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiveness is on Monday, because I don't know about you, but I cannot rise up as a butterfly when I am weighed down with resentments, with anger, with judgment. I need to forgive so that I have the freedom and the lightness. It's forgiving is what gets us there. Now, here's the thing. It starts off with, Father, forgive them. The truth is, the Father, great spirit, the divine, doesn't need to do any forgiving because the divine does not judge. The divine is pure love. All it sees is the truth of you. You had a bad behavior, so what? I love you, you know? You missed the mark. You forgot who you were. Because anytime anybody acts out in any way that is harmful to themselves and to someone else, it's because they forgot who they were. They didn't remember that they were the divine. You know, the war in Ukraine and Russia. 
I pray for those leaders that have declared war because they have so far drifted away. But do you even think about it? Even Jesus had a Judas, you know? Without Judas, you couldn't have the story. So what if everything has its purpose? And what if there was a divine assignment that Hitler or any other person comes in and does atro atrocities, but maybe there's something more that it was there to serve? It doesn't excuse killing and death and, and the suffering of people. No, it doesn't. But I'm looking for that something more. So to forgive. He says, Father. The reason why he says the word Father, and I call it God's self, the spirit that is breathing me. He says that because maybe on my judgmental part of me, I, that part of me doesn't maybe forgive. But the God self part of me remembers. And so what I do is I say, spirit within me, for I, as the spirit of truth within me, forgives. I, as the God self within me, forgives because they don't know who they are. They forgot. They didn't know what they were doing because they forgot. So I can't condemn them from that part of me that is my higher self. So, number one, you got what's on Monday? Forgiveness. Okay, we're going to Tuesday. Tuesday. What's Tuesday? Let's see how well my brain is remembering such things. I do have my notes. Tuesday is... Um, I know it's there. Oh, the word is now. See? Now. And the phrase is, today you will be with me. Verily, you will be with me in the kingdom of paradise. Today is the key word. There is, he was speaking to the two robbers on both sides of him. These robbers are metaphysically states of consciousness. The dimension of the past and the dimension of the future. So you can't experience paradise except in the now, in the today. The past and the future, when we're caught up in those states of consciousness, they rob us. Okay, thieves, they rob us from our power that exists only in the now. So we need to remember that the only time there is, the only truth time there is, is now. The question is, how much time do you spend reliving or thinking about things in the past? Nobody, right? Yes, we do. And it's not a bad thing to think about things and to have memories, but sometimes we get stuck in the past. We long for something the way it used to be. And there may be grieving because things have always been there, but do we get stuck there? Or do we want to bring ourselves into the now? And what about the future? There's worry, there's fears, there's doubt. What if it doesn't work out? What happens? I don't know. And, and so we can get caught up with the worries. We lose our power. It robs us. So the way that you can bring yourself into the now is simple. Would you like to know what it is? It's a simple phrase. It's called, I am here now. <laughs> say it. I am here now. Very good. You can say that over and over. I am here now. I am here now. I am here now. God is here now. Love is here now. I am here now. So you got your forgiveness and you got now. Okay, your next day is Wednesday. And I like because the, the word Wednesday has oneness. One and Wednesday. Wednesday is our, uh, uh, about oneness. And this is when Jesus speaks to Mary, his mother, and the disciple John. And he says, woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. Now, they were not physically related. They were not blood relations. So why did he say that? Well, because Jesus needed to break through our idea that we're separated. There's only one family. It is the family of humanity. And, you know, it's easy to like people that get a, get, we agree with. 
it's easy to like your friends, but can you see as your family? Jesus said, love your enemies. Can you love people who you totally disagree with? You don't have to like them. He didn't say that, <laughs> right? You don't have to like them or their behaviors. But our job, our mission is to love everybody, love one another as yourself, love your enemies. I love it in India. Everybody is an auntie or an uncle, you know? So we're all brothers and sisters. We're all aunties and uncles. And I love that about India because they have that, uh, that way of seeing. So who do you see as different than you? Whom you don't like? I bet you somebody came to your mind. <laughs> Just saying. Can you love them? Can you see beyond the costume and the behavior? And can you see that as a child or as a baby, that being was pure and innocent? And my job is to love all beings. And what you can say as your practice is, I am divine. Everyone is divine. I open my heart to everyone. I am divine. Everyone is divine. I open my heart to the divine as every one of us. All right, so now we've got forgiveness, right? What's the next one? Now, Wednesday is oneness. Okay, we're on Thursday. Thursday is truth. Truth. There's a T in there, so that helps. Remember, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a pretty deep time to look at that, that particular. And to, to forsake means to leave completely, to desert or to abandon. My God, my God, why have you left me, abandoned me? Now, Jesus, the great way shower and teacher, has been showing and sharing that everyone is the divine and we are one with the Father. And yet, he is on the cross, feeling abandoned, lost, deserted, forsaken. Anyone ever feel like God is a million miles away? I have. I don't feel the presence of God. I don't feel it. I don't see it. I don't sense it. You know, we all have that experience. Now, what I like about Jesus is what he was willing to say, the words. He spoke his small t truth. Why have you forsaken me? He wasn't willing to bury that. He brought the truth of his feelings to the light. Because in truth, that's what he felt. And sometimes we like to not talk about the things that are our issues, our pains, our fears. But by bringing it to the light, it brings us into this big T truth that God is still there. But you have to be willing to, to speak of the small truth of what you're feeling, not to be afraid of your feelings. They're indicators of what's going on and what is being called for. If you shove your feelings down, you can't come to the light. Bring that up to the table. This is what I'm feeling, forsaken and lost. He gave us the blueprint to speak your truth. And then once it's heard and out in the light, it can dissolve. It's about truth, to speak our truth and not to be afraid of speaking it. And you can even say, I'm afraid of speaking my truth, right? That's truth. All right, so now we've got truth on Thursday. We got Friday coming. The word is vision. He says the words, I thirst. I thirst. To thirst for something is to long for something. You desire something. You have some discomfort in your life, right? You, it, we call it divine discontent. When things are, are uncomfortable and I need something. Well, what do you need is to have that vision of what it is that you would love. Without the vision, you can't move forward. I thirst. I need something. I need to quench my thirst. Question is, what are you thirsty for? What are you thirsty for? 
what do you crave? What do you long for? To identify that and to start to imagine yourself as having it. I spoke last week of the, um, the, of the caterpillar, which has imaginal cells. It has to activate those imaginal cells, the vision of itself as a butterfly. It fights it at first, but it finally breaks through that higher self, that vision. What is the vision of what you would love? What does the butterfly you look like, feel like, sound like, move like? Have a vision and embody it, feel it, because it's the vision that's going to take you to the next level. Okay, we're moving to Saturday. Saturdays is about completion. He says, it is finished. It is finished. You have to 100% release everything. You have to not be hanging on by, you know, oh, I'm going to hang on to this. No, it is finished. Completion. Are you 100% complete in releasing what it is? Are you 100% ready for your next state of beingness, your evolution of self, a freedom of light and love? We have to be 100% complete. I'm done. Doesn't it feel good when you have a project and you're like, done, right? You feel relief. Okay, I've done everything I needed to do. I'm done with that. And you can rest. You can relax. So completion, you want to get to that state where, ah, done. It's finished. I did what he did what he came for. He created all the cross-offs. Then we come to Sunday, and that word, Sunday for surrender. Sunday is surrender, and he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, the word surrender does not mean I give up. You win, I lose. No, it's about trust to really get that I don't have to do anything else. I can just be the butterfly that I am that I've always been. I don't fight anymore. I just release and I surrender, knowing that my higher self is fully engaged. And now I am rising up into the magnificent being that I came here to be. I'm going to close with a story. It's about Jeremy. Hmm, just breathe for right now. Just breathe. You are all in a state of transformation. We're all moving from a smaller self to our unlimited self. And so I'm going to share with you about Jeremy. Jeremy was born with a twisted body and a slow mind and a chronic terminal illness that had been slowly killing him his entire life. His parents did his, their best to give him a normal life and sent him to St. Teresa's Elementary School. At the age of 12, Jeremy was only in the second grade, unable to learn. His teacher, Doris Miller, was very frustrated with him because he would squirm in his seat, drool, and make grunting sounds. At other times, he would speak clearly and distinctly, as if a spot of light had penetrated the darkness of his being. But most of the time, Jeremy irritated his teacher, and one day, she called the parents in for a consultation and said, you know, he really should be going to a special school. And the parents just said, he doesn't want to be in a special school. It would be unfair to him. He wants to have as normal of a life as possible. And the mom cried. She just was so sad that this teacher was asking this. And she's like, there's no school nearby. We, he really likes it here. So Doris, the teacher, sat for a long time with that. And she said, okay, I'm going to try and sympathize. I mean, I have it tough with Jeremy in school, but they have him all the time. So she tried her best to teach the little boy, Jeremy. But she also had 18 other kids to teach. And he was often a disruption. So 
She just threw up her hands and said, well, I keep trying, but she did her best. So she tried to ignore his blank stares and his noises. And then one day he came up to her, dragging his foot behind him, and he's like, I love you, Mrs. Miller. And she just felt her heart melt. Well, spring came, and it was time for Easter. So Mrs. Miller gave an assignment to her kids. She said, I want everyone to get it. She gave everybody a large um, Easter egg that they were to put something in it that symbolized new life. So the kids all took their eggs, and they were very excited because they were going to go home and find something to put in the eggs for, that represented new life. Well, Mrs. Miller was really worried about Jeremy because he didn't really seem to be grasping the situation. So she goes, I'm going to call his parents tonight and explain to them what this, is, this assignment is. So she gets home, but the dishwasher breaks, and something else happens, and she has to go shopping. Well, she totally forgets about calling the parents. So the next day, the kids all are excited, and they bring their, their eggs, and they put them in the basket. And um, after the math class, it's time to open up the eggs, right? So she opens up the first one, and Doris finds a flower. Oh, yes, a flower is a sign of new life. That's mine, that's mine. The next one was a plastic butterfly that looked real. Oh, okay, that's, that's a sign of new life. She opened it up. And the little boy's like, oh, that's mine, that's mine. Another one had a stone with moss in it. And little uh, Tommy says, that's mine, that's mine. The next egg she opens up, there's nothing in it. So she goes, okay, she kind of sets it off to the side, thinking that's probably Jeremy's. Well, Jeremy speaks up and he goes, Mrs. Miller, aren't you going to talk about my egg? And she goes, but Jeremy... Your egg is empty. He looked into her eyes and softly said, Yes, but Jesus' tomb was empty too. Time stopped. When she could speak again, Doris asked him, Do you know why the tomb was empty? Oh, yes, Jeremy exclaimed. Jesus was killed and put in there. Then his father raised him up. At that moment, the recess bell rang, and they all ran out to play. And she just cried. The teacher just cried. Her heart had melted by the, his empty egg. Three months later, Jeremy died. And those who paid their respects in the mortuary were surprised to see 19 eggs empty on the top of his casket. Jeremy had the butterfly consciousness. He didn't have to be smart. He had the heart. He had the heart of the divine, and he understood that life is about living and rising up. We all have a Jeremy within us. We have that part of us that believes. And to be a child, which Jesus said, to enter the kingdom of heaven, let us rise up. Let us rise up into our divine magnificence. It's in every one of us to be free. Let's rise up today in the truth of who we are as the butterfly that we came here to be. And so we do. We rise up. Mm -hmm.